Bhavantu Sahaviryam Kavahai Tejas Vinavati Tamastu Avid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May Brahman protect us. May he guide us and give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Peace, peace, peace. Well, good evening, Swami. What have you got prepared for us tonight? Uh, well, uh, there was a little, a little bit of section on Shiva here. It wasn't quite what I was looking for, but I thought we could read just a, a little bit. A separate section? Or, yeah, or, just yeah. A, yeah. Well, it's, it's a part of one, you're talking about the religions of India. I see, So yes. it's just this oh, one sure. little section yeah, of the religions yeah. of India. Um, so I thought we could do that, and then we could go back to the... Uh, um, random thoughts. Random thoughts, <laughs> yes. This is... Let's see if I can find the right Any way that you can check the volume as it's coming through? It's good, yeah. That's good. We should talk loudly, at least I should. No, no, okay. Well. <coughs> there we go. All right. I don't know why these are all funny. It's like the comics. These are the funny papers. <laughs> all right. And so... This is not off the press, so that's why <laughs> still. All right. So we start here. I see, all right. And it's 24, okay. So this is from his talk, The Religion of India Today, which was written 100 years ago. <laughs> but it probably hasn't changed much. As the Vaishnavas regard Krishna and Rama as their ideals, so there are Hindus who look uh, upon other manifestations as their ideal. The Shaivas, for example, worship Shiva, the third person of the Hindu trinity. Shiva represents the ideal of renunciation and absolute freedom from worldliness. He is revered by the Hindus as the embodiment of contemplativeness and yoga. He is therefore worshipped by the yogis, the saints, and sages of all sects. They repeat the name of Shiva with tears of love and devotion streaming from their eyes. They forget everything of the world when they utter his sacred name. Shiva and Vishnu, again, are one and the same in their spiritual essence. They are two manifestations of the one infinite being, with a capital B, who is called Brahman in the Vedas. A Vaishnava can worship Shiva in the same spirit as he worships his own ideal, Vishnu, and a Shaiva can worship Vishnu in the same spirit as he worships his own ideal, Shiva, because they know that he who is Vishnu is Shiva, and he who is Shiva is Vishnu. Shiva represents, as I have already said, contemplativeness, yoga, renunciation, and absolute freedom from worldliness. Did you want to read? Sure, at okay. least I want to kind of join in there because that's so interesting. <clears throat> so that equal sign to me is almost the essence of Vedanta, that is to say Indian spirituality. And it's been quite a shift. And the whole of the Western view of the universe has shifted. Uh, you know, India has a memorial time, thousands of years ago. And really, in a rather small number of years, tremendous changes in the 20th century and continuing have occurred in the West. And the big shift, it seems, uh, I just got a wonderful email from our friend Sid Lamb occasionally. We mentioned him in these readings because he's a man who has been searching for what is reality, mm. and now he's becoming deeply mystical. Mm. 
and he wants to write a book. And we said back, back away, look, we're not going to interfere with your book because this is your contribution, Sid, roommate, you know, in college and all. This is your contribution to the dialogue, to the, the community of discourse of the moment. But if you'd like to know what Vedanta says about some of these things you're interested in, we could talk about that, see, so that we don't interfere. And he loved it. And Swami Abedananda, just a couple of evenings ago, right evening ago, came to what I would call the summation, the synthesis. Starting out at the beginning with the three states of consciousness in the West and coming in with this cascading, overflowing waterfall mm -hmm. of super consciousness, the gift of the East. And the timing was kind of like exquisite. So he sent me a couple of uh, chapters today, and he said to Maury, and it's just a, it's a, it's a splendid book. So I have that in my mind. Now, <clears throat> what happens is, it even can happen to us, that this equal sign, which is naturally the outcome of a religion which speaks of the one shining infinity, carries right through. So we talk about Satchitananda, existence, consciousness, and bliss, you could call it a change in the perception of reality in the West. And so, for example, existence used to be thought of not that many years ago through our friends Isaac Newton and Descartes, people like that, who saw the whole cosmos as a machine, very well put together clock. Uh, God started it and it's going to run fine so he can sort of stand back and watch it. <clears throat> of material, hard objects. And then all of a sudden Einstein comes along, does he not, and says E, capital E. The only thing in the equation is E. Big. Equals MC squared. And he calls it that equation in which mass, or matter we could say, dropped out as a principle of physics in 1905. So all of a sudden, there's nothing but energy, which means there's swirls, little vortices of events, of experiences, because my dad says in the inside, energy is seen as experience. So the things that count in our life are the events, that are the experiences, because that's what we are, swirl of Matter, yeah, you could talk matter, but it's just congealed energy and matter even has a place in the mental world, according to Vedanta. It's all very exciting. But existence, which used to be a solid hard rock of an object, is now energy. And if you have big E existence and you have an arrow going this way, the next one is consciousness. Reality, which used to be thought of, has now become consciousness. And this consciousness uh, pre-exists the emanations in the outside world, just as surely as every skyscraper has a blueprint, mind first, and then the event, you see, comes out. So, the existence as an arrow of consciousness, reality has now become consciousness, and it only occurred to me, frankly, just a few weeks ago, <laughs> that you can continue that arrow from consciousness to bliss. What is the state of consciousness in the higher levels of realization? It's joy. So here we have uh, Vishnu and Shiva and Brahma. It, it really doesn't. <laughs> The important thing is where you put your mind. Yeah, I, I probably mentioned this before, but I listened to a teaching company course by mm -hmm. Professor Gimbel, and one of it was called The Search for Reality mm. uh, in Science. Mm. And he goes through every scientific discipline you could think of. Really? <laughs> and in every single one, 
he points out that they have to, uh, you know, they first look at things yes. <laughs> and individuals and small things and try to figure out what's going on. And then they realize that's not good enough. You have to look at relationships and holes and oneness and interconnectedness in every single discipline. It was a fascinating series of lectures. And you so, still have them for more? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in written form or <laughs> No, well, form? yeah, I think I do have the, the uh, transcript as well. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. And you see the point being that now it's all become much more like a plant. And that's why uh, Alfred North White Ed talked, uh, called his uh, philosophy, instead of a philosophy of hard rock stuff, uh, the philosophy of organism. It's much more mm -hmm. like the energy relations are much more of the things you would expect to see, see in a plant. Well, isn't this fun? So now, with all of this uh, freedom that he's given us, may we just continue mm -hmm. and see what happens. <laughs> Vishnu, who as is the iron in, as is the uh, uh, representation that emb becomes embodied as an incarnation in, in mm -hmm. the Indian thinking, as Rama and Krishna, is adorned by the Vaishnavas, who I take this point of view, with all blessed qualities, with all that is beautiful, all that stands for wealth, prosperity, and success in life. Shiva, on the contrary, is adorned with all that is ugly, <laughs> horrible, and awe-inspiring. I would like to think of... Is that quite so, <laughs> No, I, I, I would like to think soldierly yeah. would be a nice word to use. His beatific form is encircled by venomous snakes of evil, misfortune, and worldliness, but they cannot injure him. All the stuff that's going on in the play, and you have no further there to look than politics, parties, and countries, to find exactly what we're talking about. It's nothing more than a soccer game to them. It's not this great fountain of cascading super consciousness behind the facade of this little theater thing, like a soccer game, you're watching it on TV with a glass, and you're quite aware that there's a difference, a differentiation. And, you know, the man of steady wisdom, they have a wonderful section of Bhagavad Gita, which will be all about Krishna, in which uh, he discusses the person who is not seeing this anathema, cacophony of pain in the outer world because he's gone behind it, above it, beyond it, deeper, and sees that all this is not real. So no, I, I, yeah. I, I couldn't help but think of Gilbert's lines. Oh, we love Gilbert's there is song. beauty in the bellow of the blast. Yes. There is grandeur in the growling of the gale. There is an eloquent outpouring when the lion is a roaring and the tiger is a lashing of his tail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see. <laughs> He's speaking about a person, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, the McConnell's uh, yes, daughter in law like, like yes. yes, I like to see a tiger from the Congo or the Niger, and especially with the lashing of the tail. <laughs> Volcanoes have a splendor that is grim, with earthquakes that only terrify the dolts. But to whom who's scientific, there is nothing that's terrific in the falling of a flight of, th nothing that's terrific in the flight, uh, falling of a flight of thunderbolts. Yes, in spite of all my meekness, if I have a little weakness, it's a passion for, for a flight of thunderbolts. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, uh, quite something. So here we go. They cannot injure him. All this apparent stuff, which is where people get their heads knocked together. Shiva dwells in the Shmashana, S-H-A-S-H-M-A-S-H-A-N-A, -A -A -A, almost sounds Yiddish, or, crema <laughs> or cremation ground, where horrors, horrors of death and destruction surround him. But they cannot frighten him, because he's not paying any attention or his 
or disturb his blissful samadhi. Mm -hmm. You see, the image here, thinking about different ways that you can think about mm -hmm. God, is that she was sitting on a mountain in Tibet, Indian atmosphere, Mount Kailash, way up high. And it's so high that you say, you can say, I like to say that you could just, the stars are big and bright, like in Texas, you know, at night, big and bright. And they're so close you could just pluck them out of the sky. Mm. And here's the key point. Shiva closes his eyes and sees the light of a million suns. Mm. Oh. So it's all same thing by the time you get whichever particular way you path, you're talking about the one infinite shining. And then it says he is the ever undaunted, and that's a hyphenated word in this, right? Conqueror of all dread, danger, passion, distress, and distress. He's the ever undaunted conqueror of all dread, danger, passion, and distress. He is attended by ghosts and wicked spirits, but they cannot hurt him. H-I-M, capital. Shiva renounces the world for the good of humanity. Voluntarily takes upon himself the burdens, anxieties, sufferings, and pains of all humanity and swallows, doesn't quite swallow, just holds it in his throat, the deadliest poison to bestow immortality upon his earnest followers and true devotees. His consort, the Divine Mother of the Universe, is his only companion in austerities and penances. He lives where nobody cares to go, and he accepts the tiger skin and ashes as his ornaments. He is the ideal of the yogis, that's the meditating folks, if anyone wishes to see and understand what renunciation means, let me go to India and study the worship of Shiva. Shiva is coming up soon, I think that's why Swami is interested mm. in this. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, has, <laughs> he has many forms, many incarnations. That's interesting. I know of only one. Mm. And some people feel that's Ramakrishna. That's Ramakrishna is because we're Shaivites, uh, rather than an incarnation of Vishnu, an incarnation of Shiva. Nevertheless, and there are many symbols connected with his life. The Shaivas, followers of Shiva, worship the snow-white form of Shiva covered with ash, the snow, sitting in snow, which symbolizes purity and freedom from all taint of worldliness, the form of him, capital H, who is the master of the universe. Capital M, Shiva can be worshipped under all circumstances. If a follower of Shiva cannot find a temple, he may sit under a tree. He does not need any form, statue, or symbol. He simply closes his eyes. You want to fix that? You want to correct it? Want to simply Oh. and meditates upon Shiva as the Lord of the universe beyond good and evil, beyond all relativity. Ah, mm. Einstein. Beyond all relativity, that means the world, the phenomenal universe, the outer world, space, time, and causation. The embodiment of the infinite and absolute being, capital B. Why don't you start, buddy? The Vaishnavas and Shaivas, as we have just seen, regard the Lord of the universe as masculine and give him masculine attributes. But there are Hindus who give, oh, well, we're already through with Shiva, all right, that's right, <laughs> who gives God feminine attributes and call him the mother of the universe, call him the mother of the universe, okay, I think you met her. India is, in fact, the only place in the world where God is worshipped as the mother and where all women are considered as representatives of the ideal divine motherhood. Some people think that the Hindus deny salvation to women, but no Hindu ever imagined anything so crude, I guess. On the contrary, womanhood is attributed to 
him by him to the Lord of the universe. Well, I mean, I honestly mm-hmm. think that he said that on purpose. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Feminine, yeah. uh, God gives God, God feminine yeah. attributes and call him, capital H, yeah. the mother of the universe. Yeah. Yeah, all right. He knows that the soul is sexless and that it manifests on the physical plane as a man or a woman only to fulfill a certain purpose in life. The Bhagavad Gita says all men and women, whether they believe in God or not, are bound sooner or later to reach perfection. Mm-hmm. You want me to keep going? Oh, I, yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. Those who thus worship God as the mother are known as shaktas. The worship uh, worshippers of Shakti, the divine energy, the mother of all phenomena. These Shaktas believe that the mother of the universe manifests her powers from time to time in human form and incarnates as a woman. These have various feminine incarnations. There are various feminine incarnations among the Hindus. These divine incarnations of Shakti or divine energy are in different forms such as Kali, Durga, Tara, etc. Foreigners cannot understand the meaning of these symbolic figures used as aids to concentration and meditation at the time of worship, and they think, how hideous these forms are. Of course, some of them are hideous to Western eyes, but to the Hindus they are spiritual symbols, for the people of India are not merely optimistic, they recognize both sides. They are brave. They do not deny the evil side of the world. They take that also and adorn the mother on the one hand with evil, murder, plague, and other horrible things, while on the other hand, they represent her as overflowing with blessings and all that is good and beautiful. Those who have only optimistic ideas shut their eyes to evils and misfortunes and curse either God or Satan when these come upon them. But among the worshippers of the Divine Mother, you will find both men and women who in times of distress face danger bravely and pray to her with unflinching faith and wholehearted love, recognizing her grandeur and divine power even behind misfortune and calamity. About the six lines on the top, you want to fix concentration there with a hyphen? Yeah, this is probably, see, it's a, uh, it's a scan from a book that probably oh, paged differently. Wow. Uh, but I remember uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Dobson uh, explaining uh, the, uh, the, 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 dual, yeah, the, two, the dual aspects of Kali, uh, you know, uh, why she, she has, you know, she has two hands giving blessings and boons, and yet there's uh, images of, you know, destruction and so forth and he says and he said it's because when you see the infinitude out there it's terrifying when you see it in here it's blissful yeah. and Swami Swananda jumped out of his seat and he yeah. said, I've never heard it like that yeah. <laughs> he just thought that was the most charming way of and saying I, it. I believe yeah. I remember I really do uh, that yeah. Swami Prabhupada said that uh, uh, the, uh, the other hands are protecting. So yeah, that's a champion. Yeah. Well, now, uh, why don't you just finish that uh, section a little bit more? I thought it was ending with 46. A little bit more. The whole truth of the Sankhya philosophy is symbolized, uh, Sankhya philosophy was described in a previous lecture, it notes here, is symbolized in the Shakti worship or the div- worship of Divine Mother. You will remember that the Sankhya believes in the evolution of the world and of the whole universe out of one eternal energy, while the individual soul is known as Purusha, the infinite spirit. So Shiva represents Purusha, the formless infinite spirit, and his consort or Shakti is that eternal energy which is called in Sanskrit Prakriti. The union of the male and female principles of divinity is the beginning of cosmic evolution. I think I can pick up there for a little bit. Here you will notice how the ultimate conclusions of science, which means a lot to us. And uh, Vivekananda, you know, these moods and modes and ways of saying things. 
at one point said science and truth are all the religion there is. Hmm. Of course, science in a way means truth. Scientia, knowledge. But the search for truth, wherever they find themselves pointing around or looking, is by the same method as the spirituality of the Indian folks. That's why we like them so much. <clears throat> the criterion of validity, which happens to have been a term that Charles Saunders Peirce, the bedrock genius of American philosophy, which then, you know, stands on his hand, William James, the founder of what has called, become called pragmatism, John Dewey, and then really Alfred North Whitehead, who says he's very indebted to William James, uh, who became the world's great summation metaphysician, saying all oh, Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato. Alfred North Whitehead became that metaphysician when he came to Harvard, to the United States. It's all very interesting. Nevertheless, um, science and spirituality, to use uh, Charles Saunders Peirce's term, have the same criterion of validity, which is experience. Don't you see? And experience, of course, we've decided is really reality that used to be called hard rock objects is now energy seen from the inside, which is experience. So, he says, um, here you'll notice how the ultimate conclusions of science have been symbolized hmm, by the Hindus and made into objects of devotion and worship. Ask how the evolution of the world began and they will show you the symbol of the Purusha and Prakriti, the inner, transcendental, and the the, um, what am I trying to say, God imminent in the relative plane, which is Prakriti. The religion of the Hindus, in fact, embraces science, logic, and philosophy, seen as the love of wisdom, incidentally, which it has been a long time since that's the case in, uh, I would submit, in schools. They think that that which is unscientific, illogical, and unphilosophical cannot be called religious. They say if it contradicts reason, chuck it. That's almost virtually the, the uh, definition of, um, almost the definition of, uh, of the approach even to the scriptures of the Indian person. Ramakrishna says the scriptures are a mixture of sand and sugar. Throw away the sand. Get the part where the person was writing under the inspiration of the experience of God. The inspired experience of God. All right. So, this is, they think that that was unscientific, illogical, and unphilosophical. cannot be called religious. So they take the scientific truths make symbols out of them, how about E equals MC squared, and relating them to the eternal being, capital B, they use them as the most helpful objects for devotion and worship. The Hindu mind is very spiritual, along spiritual, uh, very inventive. The Hindu mind says, is very inventive along spiritual lines. It gives its inventive genius full play in the spiritual field. Swami used to say that it's good to be imaginative in spiritual life. There is no other religion in the world which is so rich in mythology, symbology, rituals and ceremonials, and which possesses so many phases of the divine ideal as the Sanatana, Sanatana Dharma. I want to spell it out because it's such a beautiful 
phrase and so meaningful to us. Sanatana, S-A-N-A-T-A-N-A, -A -A. new word, and this, these are capital letters, Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, or the eternal religion of the Hindus. Its followers are freely allowed to choose their ideals in harmony with their thoughts and spiritual tendencies. Of course, Aldous Huxley took that phrase and, and retranslated it as the perennial philosophy. The view that Martin of Tours, which I love and quote occasionally, 397 AD, said that all mystics speak the same language and come from the same country. And that's what Aldous Huxley attempted to do in this anthology of mystical writing called the Prayer of Philosophy. Uh, they believe that one particular set of doctrines and dogmas cannot satisfy the aspiration of all human souls. As one coat cannot fit all bodies, so for a particular ideal cannot fit all minds, cannot suit all the spiritual tendencies of all nations in all countries. Do we not see how Christianity has failed in that respect when it's tried to make the whole world the top one ideal? Do we not see today how among the followers of Christianity there's a constant fight and struggle for lack of a better understanding of their religious ideal? Human minds need variety and the paths which lead to the supreme goal should vary according to the tendency, capacity, and spiritual development of the individual. Therefore, the eternal religion of the Hindus prescribes no such path, no problem with the periods and stuff, but offers various ones to suit different minds. Dash, the path of right knowledge and right discrimination. In parenthesis with italics, Jnana Yoga of concentration and meditation, presses Raja Yoga, which is called the royal path because it's like a handle, it's common to all the other three. You could say, of work for work's sake, in parenthesis, Karma Yoga, and of devotion and worship, in parenthesis, Bhakti Yoga. Each one of these, again, has various branches. Thus we see that the Hindus alone have succeeded in giving to the world a religion which fits all minds and all tendencies under all conditions, a religion which preaches the worship of one God, capital D, comma, the infinite being, capital B, under a variety of names and ideals, truth is one but its manifestations are many. May I just ask if you think that it's picking up our brother? Oh, yeah. Good, good. Ready? Mm -hmm. This noble and sublime conception has made the Hindus extremely tolerant towards other faiths and other forms of worship outside their own. For they consider that all religions, sects, and creeds are like so many paths which lead to the same goal. I'm going to correct today there, what is it in India today? The, cap, the title? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't read the title. This is a scan, so the original may not have Pretty good. the same mistake. Those who do not understand the Hindu mode of thought have called it pantheism, but it is the worship of one universal spirit, which is infinite, omnipotent, all merciful, impersonal, and yet personal. If you call it pantheism, then you use the term in the wrong sense. Pantheism never means that. When I think that this table is God, or if I consider that God has become this chair, then it will be pantheism. But if I believe in one God who pervades and interpenetrates the atoms and molecules of the chair and the table, or any other object of the world, then that will be the worship of the one supreme spirit who is infinite and all pervading true religion according to the hindus does not consist in belief in a certain creed or set of dogmas 
but in the attainment of God consciousness through spiritual unfoldment. It is being and becoming God. It is the subjugation of selfish love and desire for self and grand grandizement. Which is a pretty good phrase to describe the ego, isn't it? How about that? The sub of selfish love and the desire for self aggrandizement. And there's assimilation. And the assimilation has to be of everything. And there you go. What does the billionaire want to do when he puts his feet on the bed in the morning? Get one more dollar. You know, see, it can never be attained that way. So we got, we're we on to something here. Yeah. The attainment of God consciousness through spiritual unfoldment. It is be, being and becoming God. It is the subjugation of selfish love and desire for self-aggrandizement and the expression of divine love, truthfulness, and kindness to all. The object of such a religion is the freedom of the soul from the bondage of the world. A Hindu is not limited by sectarian doctrines and dogmas. He can go anywhere, worship any ideal that suits him, and makes that his chosen ideal. As long as he believes in one God, there is no danger. He will have salvation, and this salvation can be attained in this life. Now, while I'm going to work on that a bit, you might want to work on the line on dogmas, where there's a lot of little periods and stuff. Mm, yeah. Mm, I think it's around in there, maybe. <clears throat> All right. Outside of the Vaishnavas, remember, these are the ones that love uh, the incarnations of Vishnu, which are primarily, uh, let's say, Rama and uh, Shiva. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Rama and Krishna. So, uh, outside of the Vaishnavas, the Shaivas and Chaktas, we find Hindus, Shiva people and, and energy people, we find Hindus who follow other phases of religion in the Punjab, the northwestern province of India. Punjab's got to be an interesting place spiritually. I'm going to be real careful not to get involved in that one right now tonight. But if you want to try to understand a lot of, what should we call it, the sociology, let's put it that way for the moment, of Indian modes of worship and thinking, uh, you might do well to, if that's your interest and your inclination, to dive into the big pool of the Punjab, the northwestern province of India. For instance, there is a large population which is known as Sikhs. S-I-K-H, and they pronounce it Sikh, is derived from the Sanskrit Sishya, S-H-I-S-H-Y-A, which means a disciple. And the Sikhs are so called because they are disciples of their master, Guru Nanak, Ka, who is a contemporary of Luther. That I did not know. Hmm. And what is their main tenet? The holy name of God. So you can see that we have a, a, a very large melding of community, communing between these different uh, <clears throat> sociological places in India where people are worshipping. Guru Nanaka was a great soul. He is regarded today by his disciples and followers as the manifestation of divinity, capital D. And he left sayings and teachings. These are written out in a book. In this book, the six hold in the same light as the Christians, their Bible, the Muslims, their Quran, and the Orthodox Hindus, their Vedas. Well, I'll let you go, buddy. If you will. <clears throat> It is to them the revealed word of God. They put it upon an altar, burn incense before it, and worship it as the word of God. They cannot bear any other form of symbol or image or the statue of any incarnation or manifestation of divinity. They are as fanatical as the Protestant Christians in their attitude towards forms and images. They observe no caste prejudice. 
They are very broad and liberal-minded, and also accept the followers of any faith in their religion. At one time, they converted hundreds of Muslims and made them six. Their book is called the Grant Sahib, or the Great Scripture, and contains the most sublime moral and spiritual ideals which harmonize with the idea, uh, teachings of the Vedas. They believe in one supreme God who is formless. As the Muslims believe in Allah, the one formless being who can take no form, so these six believe in the same way. Perhaps Sikhism arose in India through the influence of Islam. It is one of the recent sects. Oh, there's no doubt about it that they arose. <laughs> this is, yeah, this that's, is... That's another thing. To the, uh, yeah, this uh, is further uh, than uh, I intended us to read, but that's all right. Well, all right. Okay, well, let's keep going because we got a few more minutes. What else sure. can we do? Yeah, shall we? I think we should just finish a little bit. Just continue this. Because well, we're talking about uh, sure. religion in India today, uh -huh. so it's quite interesting. All right. Just Keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I think so. Besides these Orthodox Hindus, there are Jains and Buddhists. The Jains have their own scriptures and their own prophets. Parsvanat, Adinat, Mahaviranat, and many others who are called the Tirtankaras, perfected souls. These are great and immortal spiritual leaders who came down to teach mankind. Anyone who follows their teachings will reach absolute freedom from this world of imperfection. Jainism arose in India about the same time as Buddhism. Buddha lived around 557 BC. He was the founder of the great religion <clears throat> which has civilized the larger portion of Asia, which predominates in China and Japan, which has made the Japanese a great nation and which prevails today in Tibet, Siam, Burma, Ceylon, Sumatra, Java, and many other Asiatic countries. A lot of mm -hmm. uh, geographical changes since mm -hmm. you uh, gave this talk. Mm -hmm. But oh. the uh, Orthodox Hindus regard the Jains as agnostics and the Buddhists as atheists because the Jains neither accept nor deny soul or God, while the modern Buddhists in India do not believe in the existence of one supreme being, or in the existence of the individual soul as an eternal entity. Neither do they honor the revealed word of the Vedas. For this reason, they are classified by the Orthodox Hindus as atheists, although Buddhists Buddha himself is recognized as one of the incarnations of Vishnu. Every Hindu believes that Buddha came to help mankind and ranks him with Brahma, Krishna, and other avatars. Well, now that's very interesting. Um, there is a school of thought um, that thinks of the Lord Buddha among the uh, followers of the ancient river of Indian spirituality um, as an avatar, that is to say a superluminary. But, say they, he's a little different in that he did not come down from above as an avatar, but he climbed, if you will, as a man, the 12-foot ladder. Hmm. Therefore, the views about the Lord Buddha himself, which are really divided into the older form and the newer form uh, uh, in different countries, um, uh, Tibet being the newer form and the Southeast Asians the older form, uh, they're pretty careful about, um, about how they uh, relate to Buddha as an object of either worship or intensifying their worship. Um, I, I'm trying to think of an analogy here, which there is a good one, but um, it's not coming very clearly to my mind at the moment. The point being that um, the Buddhists do not call Buddha an incarnation. 
and I'll put it in, the, in we, in quotes, we do. But of a different sort. That is to say, an avatar, a superluminary, but one who did not come down as such, being an incarnation of Vishnu, uh, but one who climbed to that exalted state. So I think that's very interesting. Now let's just see Swami Howard. Yeah, the, yeah. We've run out of pages. That paragraph won't finish. So we should probably switch back to our um, spiritual teachings. All right. You Goodbye. say we've run out of Indians? Well, I mean, this paragraph won't, it doesn't go on. Oh, that one I down there. Yeah, I didn't. But uh, I don't think we actually finished this last no. one, did we? Oh, there okay. are still other heterodox Hindus who are known as Brahmas and Arya Samjis uh, and who may be compared to the Unitarians in this country. Oh, he's still in America now at this, at this particular sure. lecture of Bob Stack. That's interesting to me because all that, don't you see, was for the benefit of those who just came in, the Americans. It's good to know the audience uh, because that's quite a statement who may be compared to the Unitarians in this country. They reject all symbols and images but worship one God who is personal and without form. I want to make a little statement which I hope will be understood as sympathetic. Vivekananda says, that's kind of the way a lot of sentences begin around here, particularly I think with our Kadadar, Swami uh, Swahananda gave for Nate Pineda the, the boyhood name of Sri Ramakrishna Kadadar. And uh, Ramakrishna, as Vivekananda says, is a, and he stayed for 20 years in Vivekananda house, did Kadadar. Um, that all denominations, we'll say, arise huh, in a shower of mysticism. Some lady gets inspired in France huh, and founds, we'll say, the Shakers. And at its inception, every religion in the world was what we would call mystical, coming from the overflowing heart of the inspired soul. And one would have to sort of imagine the loving soul, as in the case of that whom we hold as the highest form of a human being, the Vigyani, who having had the opportunity of jumping over the wall into the land of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, did not stay there, but came back out again the form really of superluminaries. Why? To help mankind and humankind. Well, now, why would they do a thing like that? <laughs> Leave perfection. Has to be for love. So um, I think that we're off to uh, something very important here because the Unitarians in their formation were mystical. And not only that, but they upset the apple cart. There's a wonderful poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who was a poet and a doctor and all kinds of wonderful things, uh, called the wonderful one hoss shay. H-O-S-S -S means horse. And his idea is that the wonderful one hoss shay, some kind of a carriage, just collapsed one day. Just collapsed. In New England. And this was his delineation of the end of Puritanism to be followed, believe it or not, by Unitarianism. <laughs> so after a while, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that it was the Unitarians in their mystical fervor, in their aura still around them, surrounding them, the light of inspiration in their souls that saw and heard Vivekananda in 1893 and 96, whatever, and recognized him, if you will, as a fellow spirit. It was they who welcomed Vivekananda to their hearts. Now, things happen, and uh, religions have a history, and uh, so forth and so on. But I think that's worth, worth mentioning. Swami, do you have any thoughts in general that you'd like to bring up at this point? 
Oh. <laughs> ah, about what we've been reading yeah. or anything like that. We've been through quite a lot of yeah. Bajananda's uh, thinking because now we're back in America where he was for, as we like to say, 20, 25 years. Yes, this is mm -hmm. volume two, mm -hmm. somewhere oh, earlier mm -hmm. in the works. Of course, we started with Shaivism, so we kind of skipped Vaishnavism, <laughs> which would have been what came tonight? Just before. Yeah, 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 yeah well. tonight. There's a section on that as well. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, yeah, it's uh, when you try to explain Hinduism to people that aren't that familiar, it's it's often difficult because you have so many different ways to approach it. You can uh, look at the different sects of Hinduism, Vaishnavas, uh, Sh Shaivites, Shaktas, and so forth. You can look at uh, dualism, qualified non-dualism, and non-dualism. Uh, you can look at the four yogas, you can, and there's, you know, all of those compartments are perfectly good ways to divide up the pie, but it's the same pie. <laughs> it's not like different pies. And uh, there's a, a whole unity and there's a recognition, as he points out, that it's all one. It's just that we're looking at it, uh, taking different aspects or different... Uh, important, I think, to understand that if we have all of these different paths, the Western minds attempt to say, well, truth is truth, and there's got to be one that's right, is so totally unknown to the experiential mind of the Indian spiritual, mm -hmm. out, spirituality history, that it just couldn't be less their approach such that I'm saying that the important thing is not what you do and what I do for each other. It's what you do for yourself that counts. And where you are on the trail of the Advoitic approach, which is the Indian understanding that there is one shining reality, that's the point we've been trying to make recently. <laughs> that no matter what your port and we have them all right here in, in Los Angeles, the Hollywood Center. Mm -hmm. But it's not in my business. Mm -hmm. We say in the South, not my business. Another Where thing. you are on your path <laughs> and you shouldn't be monkeying with mine. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah that, that uh, uh, you know, if people are thinking of truth and that paths should, you know, they should be uh, somehow the same. But paths don't necessarily need to be the same. They're not like a f theology. They're a path. They just yes. get you somewhere. <laughs> yes. And I often say, you know, if I'm telling somebody how to get to Santa Monica, I could, depending on what time of day it is, and I could give them completely opposite directions. I could say, go south on the 101, yeah, yeah. and then south on the 110, and then west on the 10. <laughs> or I could say, go north on yeah. the 101. Yeah. And if you, Very nice. Oh. And it, they sound like completely contradictory yeah. uh, advice. Why would you tell one person to go south on the 101 and the other person to go north on the 101? Well, because the traffic's better this time of day <laughs> if you go to the north on the 101 instead of the south. But eventually you'll get to Santa Monica, you just have to take another freeway. But uh, so you can't 
take you know a step by step approach of this path and look at this path and take their step by step approach and think well step one ought to match step one it's not going to match step I, one. I love that and it seems that there are a couple of things that come yeah. to mind there was a fellow named Korzybski big mouthful and he was the founder of the semantic society which is not really philosophy but by golly it has weight and he would say things like the map is not the country mm -hmm. So, because it's experiential, you see. And the other thing, if I can just, I hope I don't lose that one too, because you're right on. Um, if, if we're talking about getting there, what is better than the model of an Indian family? Now, this is actually the case where the wife may have a chosen ideal, which is, I mean, this is not <laughs> uh, rare, an irregularity. And the husband may have a totally different chosen ideal. And the fun part is they may not even know what it is. <laughs> so theoretically, one could be a Christian, one could be a Buddhist, and it'd be just dandy. So the point is the most precious thing in the world is the other person's place on her and his path. Do you see where we're headed? And if we happen to say that in Vedanta we're all Advaitas, the Ramakrishna order of India, meaning that we're all trying to become one with God, whether it's your worship at the noonday hour, or in the Vaishnava approaches of seeing Shiva dance, I love it that you won't be saying, look, there the truth of Vedanta is dancing. Or in the understanding which is brought to people's attention sometimes very early in their career, like the first 24, 48 hours of being here. But they can all be blended in one day, according to one school of thought. And it's just a desecration for anybody to come and it still can happen and say my way or the highway my way is the best way and start looking down the nose when actually it's so much not one of our business that we shouldn't even know have to know what the path of another man or woman is but in that fellowship, that divine communion, we can all find our place. Swami? I think we're, we're ready oh. for our sign-off. <laughs> can I ask one more quick question? Oh, sure. Someone wants to know the difference between spirituality and, and religion, if there's any. Let's take that up another evening. We can <laughs> okay. do that. Yeah, yeah, good to see you. So may we bid you a farewell out there in Radio Land? Yeah. Yeah. We'll give our closing chant. I so. know. <laughs> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamadachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purname Vavashishyate Om Shanti 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 Filled with prominent the things we see Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is it still the same. Peace, peace, peace.